save that thou art thou my best thought by day or by night waking or sleeping thy presence my light welcome everyone to church today it's great to have you with us my name is colin watson and I'll be taking us through today where we'll be hearing from God's word. We'll be singing hymns together, confessing our sins and acknowledging that it is our great God who has saved us through Jesus Christ. Let us now give thanks to God in prayer, saying together the prayer on your screen now. Most merciful Father, we humbly thank you for all your gifts so freely bestowed on us for life and health and safety, for power to work and leisure to rest, and for all that is in beautiful in creation and in our lives. We praise and glorify your holy name. But above all, we thank you for your spiritual mercies in Christ Jesus our Lord, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. Fill our hearts with all joy and peace in believing. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We are now going to sing a hymn together. Let's sing together now. Praise my soul, the King of heaven. We're now going to hear our Bible passage for today. Our Bible reading today is from Psalm 73. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. 
They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from the burdens common to man. They are not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts comes iniquity. The evil conceits of their minds know no limits. They scoff and speak with malice. In their arrogance, they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven, and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how can God know? Does the Most High have knowledge? This is what the wicked are like, always carefree. They increase in wealth. Surely in vain have I kept my heart pure. In vain have I washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been plagued. I have been punished every morning. If I had said, I speak thus, I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to understand all this, it was oppressive to me, till I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. Surely you place them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. As a dream when one awakes, so when you arise, O Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. Yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterwards you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion for ever. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. Psalm 73 It's not fair. That's a phrase you often hear. It's often heard in my house with three children. Dad, that's not fair. All of us seem to have an inbuilt antenna to injustice that we see. And sometimes it can really eat away at you when you see terrible injustice in the world. Sometimes it can even lead you into envy and, and bitterness. I remember uh, a friend years ago telling me of how she had sunken into envy of a classmate at uni. This classmate who had no time of God, her life just seemed so much better. A new boyfriend, doing well at uni, life was fun, and she thought, have I got a raw deal as a Christian? Has it been worth it following Jesus? In Psalm 73, we meet someone who went through the same experience, a man named Asaph. And his story of witnessing injustice, well, it was a story that led him into a crisis of faith. Is God really good? He wondered. It wasn't just a philosophical question for Asaph. It was an agonising, personal question. Like, uh, like many of us, Asaph had grown up believing God is good. That was the creed he had taught, he was taught, he'd grown up with. But he was left in a place wondering, how can I keep believing God is good when I see such injustice, when I see the wicked prosper? And we can have the same struggle, can't we? We can struggle to believe God is good when we see injustice. And in our old age, it's easy for us to become bitter so we have much to learn from Asaph's story. Well, we don't know exactly when Asaph lived, 
Uh, He lived in the time of the temple in Jerusalem many years before Jesus Christ. And uh, in this psalm, he sort of tells his story in three parts. First of all, there's the part where he started to doubt God's goodness. He starts with his creed in verse 1. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. Sounds a bit like what Jesus taught many years later. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. But what happened to Asaph? Envying the wicked led him to doubt God's goodness. He says, as for me, verse 2, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. Why? Verse 3, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Those who have no regard for God, no time for God, they were prospering. You can feel his anger. It brings him to a point of crisis. He's struggling with his faith at this point. These people who have no time of God for God. Verse 11, they say, how can God know? Does the most high have knowledge? It's just like people today saying, well, I'm going to live life my way. I'm in charge of my life. Asaph saw people like that and he saw that they were prospering, particularly compared to people who were faithful. He reaches a point of crisis in verse 13. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure. In vain I have washed my hands in innocence. He reaches a point where he he feels like throwing up his hands in the air and saying, why? Has it all been worth it? Trying to be pure, trying to be faithful to God. I wonder if you've ever felt that way. I wonder if you've ever felt that envy and that anguish. The second part of Asaph's story is how he reaches a turning point. That's in verses 16 and 17. In verse 16, Asaph says, when I tried to understand all this, it was oppressive to me. I couldn't understand all this. Verse 17 gives us a turning point with that little word till or until. Verse 17, until I entered the sanctuary of God, Then I understood their final destiny. In other words, he obviously went to the temple and God revealed to him somehow the final destiny of the wicked. What Asaph is saying here is, I finally saw the big picture that I was missing before. So important to see the big picture, isn't it? I remember once going to a a, a museum of art in New York And there was a wonderful, enormous painting uh, by the French painter Monet. And I remember when you came up very close to the painting, all you could see was very rough brush strokes. And the picture didn't make sense. But if you stood back and took in the whole picture, then you were looking at it the right way. And you could understand what the painting was about. It was a beautiful pond of lilies. That's the experience Asaph had. He finally saw the big picture. He saw that although the wicked are prospering now, that's only for a short time. God's judgment will come. He says in verse 18, Surely you, that's God, you've placed them on slippery ground, you cast them down to ruin, how suddenly they are destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. So in other words, to change the illustration, instead of just seeing one photograph, he now sees the end of the movie, that God's judgment will come very suddenly. And isn't that exactly what Jesus taught? How people will be going about their daily lives and then the end will come and he will return to judge the world. So after this turning point, the rest of the psalm gives us Asaph's rediscovery of God's goodness, and that has so much to teach us. Asaph begins to rediscover God's goodness for himself. He realises, verse 23, he says, Yet I am always with you. You hold me by your 
right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will take me into your glory. He realises God has always been with him, even when he was in the midst of terrible anguish and, and confusion and deeply perplexed, God was holding him with his right hand. And then he begins to recognise again the great gift God has given him. What is the greatest gift God gives? I remember asking that at a church service once, and I got a very enthusiastic answer from the front row. Eternal life. Eternal life is the greatest gift that God gives. Well, that is a wonderful gift of God, but there's an even greater gift. God's greatest gift to us is himself. And that's what Asaph realises. Verse 25, whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. It's a wonderful memory verse, isn't it? Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. As uh, some of the great theologians have said of the par- in the past, God is not the means to some other end of good things. God is the final end. He is the greatest good we can have. And Asaph appreciates this. He recognises what he has and that there is nothing else greater to desire than God himself. So that's Asaph's story. What about our story? What about your story? How can we learn from Asaph? How can we, like Asaph, rediscover God's goodness and keep holding on to God's goodness? Well, three quick points for us. First of all, look at the big picture. God will bring justice in his own time. He has his own timetable. It doesn't fit our timetable, but we must come to terms with it and trust his timing. Now, when the Apostle Paul went to Athens to preach the gospel, he said, God has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. And he's given proof of this by raising him from the dead. Jesus' resurrection tells us that Jesus will return to judge the world and bring justice. Sometimes we just stare at what's happening and it's like we're looking at the brush strokes of the painting and not standing back and taking in the whole picture of what God is doing in the world. God has set a day when he will judge the world. So that also means that we should not follow the path of envy. Instead, we should walk in thankfulness. When Asaph was envying, he he described himself like a brute beast before God. You see, beasts only, an animal only reacts to what's in front of it. But for someone who knows the big picture in Jesus Christ, we don't have to fall into envy. Instead, uh, we should pity non-Christians, people who don't know Christ. We should pray for them. Without Christ, they're without hope. We should love them. We should not envy them. Instead, we should be thankful for what we have because we have every spiritual blessing in Christ. Uh, Envy, I think, is a bit like snoring. Uh, You you don't own up to it and uh, you don't know you're doing it until someone else tells you. Uh, Asaph realised envy was not the way. Instead, uh, we need to be thankful for God's goodness. The final lesson is to keep God as your treasure. Whom have I in heaven but you? Asaph realised God is the greatest gift. He is the greatest treasure anyone can have. Why do I treasure other things more than God? Why do I want to be near them? Why do I want to be near my computer, my phone, my TV, even my family? It's good to be near my family. But why do I want to be with them even more than God? God is the greatest gift we can have. He is the greatest good we can experience. Psalm finishes with these wonderful words. As for me, it is good to be near God. I've made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. Keep God as your treasure. It's good to be near him. It's good to meet with God as we're doing now at church. And it's good to meet with God ourselves when we hear the Bible, read the Bible, 
when we pray to him. The words of the hymn that we often sing at church, Be Thou My Vision, are very apt, I think. Naught be all else to me, save that thou art. God is our greatest treasure. If we keep trusting in him as our refuge, keep treasuring him above everything else, then we'll rediscover that he really is good. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it's good to be near God. I've made the sovereign Lord my refuge. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we want to repent of the times we have fallen into envy and despair when we've seen the injustice of this world and not had faith in your big picture that you will bring justice. We do pray for our broken world. We do pray that you will hasten the day when the Lord Jesus will return to judge the world with justice. And we pray for ourselves that we would keep holding on to your goodness, that we would not be envy, but we would be thankful in Christ. And in his precious name we pray. Amen. Let's sing together our next hymn, Be Thou My Vision. Would you like to join me in prayer? From Psalm 25, turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. Relieve the troubles of my heart and free me from anguish. Look on my affliction and my distress and take away all my sins. Our loving Heavenly Father, we come before you aware of your greatness and our own weakness. In times of difficulty, we are acutely aware of our frailty our pain, our powerlessness, we feel helpless and anxious. At times our hearts are overwhelmed to the point of despair. Cause our troubled hearts to turn to you, to rely upon your word, to take hold of your promises and to trust in your goodness and mercy and compassion. Thank you that we are not alone, but your spirit is within us reminding us that we are loved in Jesus, that our sins are wiped away, that we are precious to you, you are present with us and we are loved. 
May our faith be proved genuine through times of trouble. Keep us from falling away and cause us to give you the thanks and praise that you deserve. Thank you that you promise you do not test us beyond what we can bear. And we pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. We're now going to sing our final hymn. God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life an atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. O oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood To every believer, the promise of God And every offender who truly believes That moment from Jesus a pardon receives Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he has done. Great things he has taught us, great things he has done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son, but purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our rapture, when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he has done. Thanks for being with us today. We're really looking forward to seeing you again next time. And please, can I encourage you to continue to read God's Word. God bless, and we'll see you soon.